Good morning. My name is Jennifer Kilmer. I'm the director at the Washington State Historical Society, and it's my honor to welcome you here today. Um, before I begin my remarks, I want to thank the Veterans of Foreign Wars of Olympia Post 318 Honor Guard, led by Ken Wojenski for posting the colors and to Kayla McLaren of Lopez Island Middle School for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Washington State Historical Society is proud to join with our partners for today's program, and we have many partners, including the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs and their director, Alfie Alvarado, who's joining us today.
Families cut back on needed foodstuffs, follow the U.S. Food Administration guidelines using substitutes and cooking for food staples like flour and sugar, resulting in recipes like the gingerbread that I hope you all try. Today we honor the history of that era in a special program that considers what it meant to be a Washingtonian during wartime, overseas and at home, and how our students are discovering the history of the veterans and soldiers who lost their lives in the war. And above all, we honor the people who served and their families from across our state and those who gave their lives in the Great War, World War I. I would like to um, now welcome Senator Steve Conway, the 29th district, representing Pierce County, including the region that is home to Joint Base Lewis McCord. He is a strong advocate for veterans and active duty members, and it's a pleasure to welcome him to the program. Well, I must say I'm, I'm uh, humbled by the invitation here. <laughs> And uh, I, I know why I got asked is because I, I actually uh, visited with the Department of Veteran Affairs and with the Washington State History Association about whether there was anything we need to do on the legislature, in the legislature, to commemorate this, this important event of World War I and its impact on our state. And I think that's why I got invited up here. And I have a few historians. I am a historian, some of you should know. I have a PhD in history, in modern European history, actually. And, and so I don't consider myself an authority here. But as long as I'm here, I think we should uh, ask some of our legislators who are here to stand up. I see Christine Reeves. Christine, stand up. Uh, <laughs> and you should know we are in a, a second session here, and even though many of us are not actually, we're here, but we're not actually going to be moving any bills soon, so we're mostly here and able to be here today. You know, I think we should, I'm just going to tell you what I feel as a historian. This was the deadliest war in human history. The deadliest. And I think many of us think that it probably was World War II, but when you look at these figures, and I had a little different picture than yours, 38 million military and civilian casualties in World War I. That's huge. And, I, and as I looked over the statistics, I did a little research, you know, the internet today is so beautiful in terms of mm -hmm. what you can find out. And I looked and I saw what the Eastern Front of World War I meant. And, you know, I also think about this important statistic, 4.7 million Americans mobilized. That's huge. That's huge, and you gotta think of what that means. You know, this, this America had never mobilized that many soldiers. And then to have transported almost over a million of them to France itself, in the course of, you know, we, we incidentally, the poppy I have here came to me because on April 6th, the VFW Lodge brought poppies to the legislature because that was the outbreak of World War I for America. But those 53,000 were killed fighting in France, 63,000 by disease, and remember, the flu, right? the flu pandemic that hit not only the civilians, but hit the troops as well. And two, and I always remember this statistic, and one I think we should never forget, the 205,000 soldiers who were wounded and came back to this country and faced what? You know, you have to ask yourself, you know, this was not a country, that was a country that had just prepared itself for war, but it had it prepared itself to handle the casualties of war. And today we're doing such a much better job at that. And 
fact, I don't know how, you know, I think there is a history to be written about this American's, uh, the community's response to the casualties of war. And a war of shell shock and gassing. And, you know, I, I, mean, I hope many of you saw the PBS series on the Great War because it brought visually to us so many of those pictures of those soldiers who returned from France and to what? Today we're recognizing, we call them the Dolores, but today we recognize over 1,600 who died and, and, and we must honor that sacrifice and remember the families of that sacrifice. Uh, I, uh, I, I personally am kind of impacted by this because it just happened, something that I haven't actually spent a lot of time thinking about. But I have a great uncle by the name of by the name of Edmund Conley, who was 22 years of age, was killed November 1st, 1918, in the Argonne Luce Battle in France. He was a member of Company D of the Second Engineers Corps and was a corporal. He died being gassed. And he left a hole in my family. And I didn't know him, he was a great uncle of mine. But he probably left a mark on my great grandfather's family. And, and that is the history that we need to be concerned about. And I recognize all the work that's being done here. You know, World War I, to me, I read, as I was watching the PBS series, how many of you saw the PBS series on the Great War? Great, great job they did. If you haven't got it, I'm sure you can catch it sometime. But it stated in the end of it, and I wrote it down because I hadn't thought that I'd be able to use it, the modern version of America was born in World War I. The modern version of America. So this, this change that World War I brought to America is so significant. And I'm only going to talk here about some things that are relevant to the veteran side of this. In 1917, Congress established, passed legislation to provide disability compensation insurance for service personnel and access to both rehab. This clearly was a recognition of what was going on in all these other countries. France and England and the impacts of trench warfare, of shell shock, of mustard, the loss of limbs. This was the first example of the American government saying we have a responsibility to care for those who are injured. And I know of no history, maybe Alfie will correct me here and knows more. I asked Alfie when the DVA came about, but apparently the states were administering this law, but I don't know who did it. Was it the Department of Social Health? Anyone here know? <laughs> I don't know either. And if that's the kind of things we need to kind of dig into here. Another important fact of that was that, you know, every year we do, it seems, a gold star bill in the legislature. And the gold stars began in World War I. The gold star was invented for the mothers of, of families who had lost their loved ones. And now, and this began in World War I. We began the selective service in World War I, too. That's the beginning of it. And of course, Veterans Day. And as I was thinking, I brought an important issue that we did do something about in the legislature was to honor the 100th anniversary of JBLN. A hundred years, the beginning of, of, of Base Lewis, a hundred years ago. And you've got to think, you know how many soldiers went through Base Lewis in World War I? 60,000 soldiers went through that base. And what did they do, just like they do today? Did they were 
I mean, where they were in our community, right? They were in our state. 60,000 soldiers came through Fort Lewis during World War I. And of course, you know, I, I got to thinking, yeah, of course, World War I impacted all of our industry, right? It impacted, because of wartime demand for goods. And I did a little searching out, because I'm kind of interested in shipbuilding. <laughs> And here in Bremerton, during the war, the Bremerton shipyard built 25 sub-chasers, seven submarines, two minesweepers, seven tugs, two ammunition ships. They were building mostly, and this was also going in Todd Shipyard and also bigger shipyard in, 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 in mm -hmm. Seattle and Tacoma. Again, submarines and cargo ships being built. The history there as well. You know, I don't think we'll ever be able to understand the sacrifice without really trying to understand the values. And I, I took a little time to go out and visit the Wayne Victory Memorial here. And, and to stand there trying to figure out the sacrifice, the human sacrifice, and what it meant to that generation. And on that, on that north face is the phrase, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. On the west face, their sacrifice was to vindicate the principles of peace and justice in the life of the world. In the life of the world. And on the south of taste, they sought to safeguard and transmit to posterity, to us, the principles of justice, freedom, and democracy. You know, the memorial has the bronzes of a sailor, of a soldier, of a marine, and a Red Cross nurse. And you know why they're looking east? For France. And I thought it only affected, you know, I have the poppy, which was also the product of the World War I, to end with this very famous poem that many of us know in Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields the poppies flow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel of a foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. So puppy, puppies grow now in Flanders fields. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Conway. It's a very moving speech, and what a wonderful way to end that poem that we all remember. I'd like to now please welcome Alfie Alvarado, the director of your Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs. Alfie retired as a command sergeant major from the United States Army after a 22-year career and has the distinction of being the first woman to lead the State Department of Veterans Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Alfie. I can't tell you what a pleasure and honor it is for your Washington Department of Veterans 
Affairs to be one of the uh, sponsors or partners in this celebration. Um, the win victory, and I know Senator Conway talked about it, is probably my favorite monument of them all. And that's probably because it has the depiction of the nurse, a woman, and many of the monuments, as you see them across the country, they don't make that detail. And that is something that is very important and very unique to the state of Washington. I travel as director to many state capitals and will tell you that our capital campus is probably one of the most beautiful of them all. Uh, to me, it's, it's set apart because of all of the memorials and uh, monuments that are in it that honor the service and sacrifice of all of those who serve on active duty. Memorials aren't about glorifying wars or battles, they're about remembering. They're about reminders for the future generations. They're reminders that men and women before us put their lives on hold to be able to serve in our military. Some came home and some didn't. And along with the service members were the families who gave and sacrificed so much on behalf of their loved ones. Whether it was a temporary loss or because of deployment and the service member came back or a permanent loss because that service member was lost in service to their country, their families grieve and we honor them too. The memorial that we have outside of our Capitol campus here serves as a gathering place. You see people coming from all over the state and from other countries, and they just gather. It's a magnet, it's the most beautiful, it's centric, and people just look at it, take pictures in front of it, and honor the memory of those who serve. They, we offer our gratitude and thanks also in it. And it also teaches future generations that freedom is not free, and it has been earned and defended by all of those who passed on who served in our military, and especially World War II. So thank you, all of you, for being here today and joining us and making sure that the legacy of our World War I veterans is not forgotten. Thank you. for those inspiring words. And please now welcome Greg Lane, Washington Department Deputy Secretary of State. Greg has served the Secretary of State's office since 2014. Part of his responsibilities include oversight of the Washington State Library, the Washington State Archives, which both have displays here today, as well as Le Legacy Washington, a program that documents extraordinary stories in Washington's history. Thank you, Greg, for joining us today, and thank you, Archives and Library, for being here. Good morning. Uh, I bring best wishes from Secretary Wyman. She really regrets not being able to be here in person today. Um, many of you might know she's fighting her own battle at the moment. Um, she's just started her third week of cancer treatment. Um, she was in the office yesterday, though. Uh, her spirits are very high. She's doing well. Um, she's also very optimistic. We're all very optimistic and positive about the prognosis. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're hopeful. Uh, but she really does regret not being able to be here in person. Uh, but it's really a privilege for me to be here um, to represent her this morning and also to commemorate such a historic occasion and, and most importantly, to pay tribute the Washingtonians who sacrificed um, their lives and so much else in this conflict. Um, wow, it's, what an honor to, to hear the comments of the speakers before. Thank you very much for being here and sharing that. I've learned a lot of great information, Senator Conway. Um, it's, um, it's just an honor uh, for us to be able to participate with all these fantastic partners uh, in this ceremony today. As we reflect on the 100th anniversary of America entering the war, um, we're reminded of the importance of what unity between nations is, standing together to protect liberty and freedom and, and oppose tyranny and oppression. We're also reminded of the sense, the strong sense of unity and purpose that galvanized the individuals who served and sacrificed. And they came from towns all throughout Washington, from Raymond to Mount Vernon, to Wenatchee, to Clarkston, citizens from our state, both individually and collectively, felt a connection to those greater causes 
and a desire to make a difference. I'm a member of Generation X, um, and I'm particularly struck when I'm able to participate in ceremonies like this about the sacrifices made of, gen of the generations of World War I and World War II, and the risks, the unbelievable risks that they were willing to take to protect their future and the future of their children. Frankly, uh, the vast majority of my generation and those uh, after me, we have no concept, really, of what sacrifice is, um, nor we have a grasp of the horrific horrors that uh, men and women faced in wars like World War I and World War II. But we owe that fact, the fact that our lives today are so very comfortable directly to those sacrifices made by those generations, those fellow Washingtonians and Americans from so long ago. And it's really an honor to acknowledge, remember, and thank them here today. As part of the Secretary of State's office, uh, Susan reminded you, uh, we have the State Library and the State Archives. And both of those institutions help tell these stories um, in historic newspaper headlines, in diaries, in reports, and photographs, and documents. Uh, we've brought some examples here um, of, on display out here. I hope you have a chance to take a look at that. Um, but those are really just a very small subset of, of what is available in our collections. And I would encourage you, if you have interest in exploring World War I, World War I or other aspects of Washington's history, that you check out what's available in the archives and the library. Uh, the Legacy of Washington program also celebrates Washington's history. Last year we did a tremendous exhibit uh, on World War II. Uh, upcoming, this coming year, we're going to do an exhibit on Washingtonians who participated in the Korean War. All that information is available online. Uh, those exhibits are available to view online. Tremendous information and the stories that we tell through those exhibits are just incredibly compelling. And I really encourage you to check that out as well. It's so important to preserve our history with artifacts like these and stories to tell that history to generations to come. Doing so allows them to better understand the impact of these huge world-changing moments and events. And it also helps them to develop a strong awareness of what America's role and our history was in shaping and in playing the role that we did to shape how the world is that we live in today. It goes without saying that any war is a horrifying event with long-term consequences for all sides involved, but standing together and defending people whose liberties are threatened is a noble, honorable act. And we're proud today to demonstrate and celebrate for all generations together the bravery, nobility, and honor of those Washingtons Washingtonians who served in World War I. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, and thank you again to your colleagues at the State Library and State Archives. I particularly wanted to thank State Librarian Cindy Aiden and archivist Ben Kelly for participating in the program today. Thanks, Ben, for the music. <laughs> to introduce um, a distinguished national award-winning public historian, Dr. Lorraine McConaughey. Lorraine has been a leader in presenting Washington State history for many years at the Museum of History and Industry in Seattle, and as an honored <clears throat> Humanities Washington speaker, presenting historical programming in venues across the state. Today she will be speaking on uh, Washington during World War One, and we are very honored to have Dr. McConaughey joining us today. Thank you, Lorraine. some of the themes of World War I, the Great War in Washington State. 
So you may smile at the notion of a home front here when you think about what the home front was like in Belgium or France. But I'm going to make the argument over the next 20 minutes or so that there really is quite a lot to remember about this period of time. As you see here in Aberdeen, the spirit of the American doughboy in the World War. So there weren't two yet, right? In 1926, when this was erected, there was the World War, the Great War. And we could be in Twisp, we could be in Squim, we could be in Burien, we could be in Spokane or Kennewick, all across this state. There are memorials of many sorts. They may be a stadium, they may be a highway, they may be a park, they may be a plaque on a bridge, they may be a Pershing Avenue or a Wilson Drive. But we have this place-based memory of the wartime home front here and what it meant. And it's my job to speak a little bit about that. As Sue mentioned, I'm, I'm working with Humanities Washington now, doing programs throughout our state at libraries and retirement communities and schools to talk with residents of the state about World War I. And I can tell you, now that I'm sixth of the way through, the interest that the citizens of our state have in this war, which we pretty casually think of as forgotten, I think would surprise you. But it isn't just the story of the Great War that intrigues them. It's the war to end all wars, the war to make the world safe for democracy, the world that the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson in the Treaty of Versailles and the creation of the League of Nations was intended to reshape for the future. What I mean is that our people in our state want to use the opportunity of commemoration to reflect not just on this war, but on the war. Why do we fight? What do we defend? What is worth living for? What is worth dying for? What do we resist? What do we protect? These are the deeper themes of war that I, I think, as a public historian, World War I allows us to address. So I'm a historian, and what we do is complicate things. But I will not complicate things at length. I promise you that I will be, I will be economical. It's not changing on our screen. And, oh, this is great. Okay. <laughs> All right. 1,642 men and boys and a few women who were nurses lost their lives in this war. But if you think about what the wounding of this soldier represents, it multiplies that number manifold. And if you think about the families that were touched by those deaths and by those wounds, wounds that could be psychological or emotional, as well as physical, this touched every family in, in our state. And it mobilized industry throughout the state, agricultural industry. Food is a weapon of war. The withdrawal of food is a weapon of war. To create, to, to grow grain and to make bread for the starving nations of Europe was an act of benevolence before the war. And you find here the underpinnings of prohibition in state. As a Western direct democracy state, we are able to put initiatives on the ballot. We don't have to wait for uh, an amendment to the Constitution to enact prohibition. We enacted it ourselves in 1915. Um, so January 1st of 1916, prohibition began in Washington as a state measure to conserve grain in large part. This is the mobilization of agriculture for the war. And the woods and the mills were mobilized for war. Boeing or incorporates in 1916. The shipyards throughout the state are constructing throughout the war. Boeing's first big contract was to build Navy trainers. Everyone knew that war would be moving to the sky, but very few people knew how to fly. So building trainers was the wisest way. What do you build them of? Spruce, a light, tough wood. 
If you've built model airplanes out of balsa and tissue paper, you, you have the sense of what the Boeing company was doing. But harvesting fur for ship manufacture, for barracks, for every kind of application. This is a mill. It could be anywhere in our state. It doesn't matter where it is because the woods were mobilized for defense production during the war, and so were the mills. And this is the first time we begin, can begin to think about radical organized labor. And the home front battles that took place here in our state between those who resisted the war and those who um, supported the war. This is, a ship, this is the Boeing Company on the Duwamish River in Seattle. Um, this place got its, got its traction during the war. We find in the 1920s, when all the government contracts are canceled, Boeing is building furniture to stay in business. A tenacious, opportunistic, um, determined um, industry. And this is a shipyard. So we heard a little bit about Bremerton, Skinner and Eddy Shipyard in Seattle, built more ships than any other shipyard in the United States for the shipping port. So this is where all the fur is going. So we have mobilized factories, mobilized forests, mobilized mills, and mobilized fields. I won't dwell on this because I know it's dull to look at. We've been talking about industrial mobilization. U.S. entry into the war was much delayed. There was tremendous isolationist sentiment here in Washington State. Why get involved in foreign entanglements? We've heard that phrase all of our lives. These are distant wars that have very little to do with us. So the United States entered the war in April of 1917. Woodrow Wilson had run for the presidency second term in 1916, saying, I kept you out of war. He kept us out of war. But unlimited submarine warfare by the Germans um, and the Zimmerman telegram and a whole lot of other things uh, changed his mind. And we find the registration um, for the very first time of the draft and enlistments as well. Organized labor, well, this is the Wobblies in large part, the industrial workers of the world, organizing in 1905 in Chicago and sweeping west like a flame. Organizing where, where working conditions were hardest, usually among single footloose men. The American Federation of Labor with its craft unions organizing in the shipyards. So, um, boiler makers, machinists, electricians, radical labor, very strong in our state at this time. We'll talk a little bit more about the Wadleys. Immigration. One in four Washingtonians was foreign born in 1910. One in four. So, and that varied, of course, depending on where you were, but these are immigrants from all over the world, from China, from Scandinavia, from Italy, from Mexico, um, coming to the United States uh, to work. Hyphenated Americanism, is, is a term you'll see all over the editorials in 1910, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So uh, my name is McConaughey. Someone might say, you're an Irish American? Sorry, if you're Irish, go back to Ireland. If you're American, you're an American. Hyphenated Americanism is disloyal. Prohibition arises here in the state, as I've said. The influenza epidemic, 1918, 19, it's, a, it's an ugly metaphor for the internationalism of that period of time. This sweeping epidemic dis disease that carried off the five, the tens of thousands here in Washington State alone. The general strike, three days in 1919, 35,000 workers going out to join 30,000 workers from the Skinner and Hedge <coughs> 65,000 organized laborers going out for three days to shut down Seattle. Um, and, you know, there had not been a general strike prior to that. The entry to the Roaring Twenties. You know, I'm in my 70s, and I've lived through war much of my life. And war disorients social mores. War changes things on the home front. It changes the way we live and work, and we will see that. And we will also know about the loss and sorrow. So I'm thinking of this decade, 1910 to 1920, it's the most dense, extraordinary decade in Washington's history. And at the heart of it is the war. Soldiers of the Great War is a multi-volume set that I imagine is at the Washington State Library. Yes, it is. Or you can go to Google Documents 
and go online and look at page after page after page like this of men who lost their lives in the war. And you can't see what I'm doing. So this is the kind of list that you will find there. These are men who died on the battlefield in combat, who died of their wounds thereafter, who died of accident or who died of disease. And they're divided by their rank, but their, their names and their hometowns are given. This is a biography of our state's sorrow. This is a biography of our state's suffering during the war. Here, you see soldiers on the Tulalip Reservation. We see soldiers of every sort and you can go through page after page of this and see these men come, come to life of whom we know so little in so many ways. I really honor the project um, that Orcus is undertaking um, to, and, and there are genealogical societies throughout the state who are also documenting the lives of these forgotten veterans. This is not a high quality image, bear with me. If you ever find a better res of this, let me know. But this is the best way to show you the anti-immigrant sentiment that not every Washingtonian felt. But this was a, a syndicated cartoon, a political cartoon. You see Lady Liberty guarding the door to America. And she has two fierce mastiffs named Law and Order. And she's preventing immigrants from the sewers of Europe. You see the sewers across the Atlantic Ocean there. Italy, Russia, and Germany. They're swarming over the wall into Ellis Island, if you will. And they're bearing dangerous ideas and weapons. Violence and dangerous ideas. So you see this fellow here with a manifesto under one arm and a bomb under the other. His hat is labeled Nihilist. So this is the fear that hyphenated Americanism brought. When one in four speaks a foreign tongue, um, it, it is a dangerous time. This is a syndicated um, political cartoon. Not everyone felt this way, but it is significant enough that I wanted you to see it. Hun is an ugly word for a German, and we know other ugly words of that kind. What this political cartoon from the post-intelligencer does is identify German Americans with fear and with the waste of grain. So Hun Rule Association, it's a, it's a Pl platoon of marching beer barrels. And they ruin families, they rob women and children, they fill penitentiaries, and they waste grain. This is an argument to the voters of 1915 here in Washington to uh, support prohibition. This is a hyphenated American. This is Mateo Starcevich, who was the sheriff of King County. And you see here a number of the stills that he and his men have confiscated from the opportunistic agricultural, the farmers of King County who said, hmm, hmm, we have milk cans, we have coppers to wash diapers in, I know how to weld, let me get a radiator out of the Ford truck and let's see what we can do. I did a drug <coughs> history interview 30 years ago with a guy who remembered you could look down any valley in western <coughs> Washington at night and see the fires under the stills because the bootleggers were making so much liquor. The price of the fifth of gin fell in Seattle between 1916 and 1933. There was so much supply. <laughs> this is a war of propaganda. These propaganda posters are enormous. And you can see of the beauty of them. You know, the, the war information folks hired the best illustrators that they could find in order to convey their message. This is a war of women and children, as well as a war of men. And women were involved in every aspect of, uh, uh, of, of preparing for war, of carrying on war, of rolling bandages. And here's a child. It's a victory garden. Wrong war, but that's what it is. It's a victory garden to save the world. And it's a beautiful poster, as is this. So the blue-collar workers of the organized industries that I have mentioned are being asked to dig deep in their pocket to pay, pay for the war. And you see this guy, and he's in his coveralls. He works at Skinner and Eddie, or he works out in Bremerton. Sure, we'll finish the job. Um, and again, this is, this is propaganda. This is intended to encourage you to, to behave in a certain way, as women were asked to cook meatless, cook wheatless, 
and you have examples back there of their gingerbread. The Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world. And this is a political cartoon from their periodical. And what you see here is the idea of one big fist, where all of the roots go down into the industry, where the AFL organized craft by craft, local by local, the IWW wanted to organize vertically the entire business. So when they tried to recruit at Boeing, they started with the janitors, and they went up to the engineers. One big union. The hand that will rule the world, one big union. One big union, one big strike, one big revolution. Bear in mind in this decade, 1917, is the Bolshevik revolution in Russia that created the Soviet Union. The mayor of Seattle and a number of legislators in our state believed that the Wobblies were Bolsheviks and they were precursors of a revolution that the general strike of 1919 was intended to precipitate. This is a poster from the University of Washington and it, it speaks for itself in many ways. The mottos down the right side go, we rule you, we fool you, we shoot at you, we eat for you, and we work for all. This is the wobbly point of view. So the sack of money is at the top of the pyramid. Under it are legislators all over the world, kings, prime ministers, they rule you. Under them are rabbis, priests, they fool you. It's the Marxist notion that religion is an opiate, that religion tells people to be quiet, be still, um, and you'll have pie in the sky when you die. Then below that, we shoot at you. The Wobblies called the Great War the rich man's war for poor men to die in. The Wobblies argued that a person who made ships in Washington State had more in common with a person who made ships in Hamburg than they had dividing that. And who was Archduke Francis Ferdinand anyway? That one should really be concerned about his, his assassination um, and the interlocking alliances that drove the European war. Absolutely marvelous. So we rule you, we fool you, we shoot at you, we eat for you. And there you see <coughs> a huge banquet of people swilling champagne and stuffing squab down their mouths. And underneath, you have the laboring, the laborers who hold it all up. And of course, as the Wobblies perceive them, they're tubercular, they're skinny, they're dying, they're children. This is the Wobbly perspective. And so, just as the Wobblies were considered Bolsheviks, they were also considered the Hun. They were the enemy. And so in Centralia and in Everett, we have massacres where there are wars fought between those who opposed the Wobblies and the Wobblies themselves. The free speech fights in Spokane, um, where Wobblies read the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and all its amendments 24 hours a day into a megaphone until they were arrested. This is really drawing lines here on the home front. So, we talked about the industrialization of the woods. We should also talk about its militarization. So the Wobblies in the woods poured sugar into gas tanks and spike trees. They refused to harvest spruce and, and fir for the military industrial complex. And they would, they would sketch an, an, a cat with an arched back uh, to, to make sure that you knew who had poured sugar into your gas tank. So they were replaced by the military. So the Spruce Production Division, under the Signal Corps of all bizarre things, um, Spruce for the air and fur for the sea, the Loyal Legion Log of Loggers and Lumbermen is a state organization of loyal men in the woods, in the mills, the strength of their blows and the loyalty of their hearts would win the war. So we have the Wobblies now on blacklists. And you can read blacklists in newspapers all across the state. Uh, the Wenatchee Valley Growers Association had its own blacklist that was published. Um, the North Bend Timber Company, and I'm sorry, we could go on and on with that. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> so scary. So, so the war comes to an end, and it comes to an end, and our story isn't quite done yet. But the celebration of the end of the World War, it was very different than the celebration at the end of the Spanish-American War. Talk about a forgotten war. Um, it, it, people were, were thrilled. Those who came home would, 
that they came home to open arms here in Washington State. And the Skinner and Eddy workforce walked out. When the government contracts were canceled overnight, Skinner and Eddy started building tuna boats. And they laid off 70% of the men and women who worked in the shipyard, and they lowered the wages of those that remained. So we see the beginning here of the general strike in Seattle. Woodrow Wilson now is critiqued in this political cartoon as, as a fool, as a dreamer of dreams, a smoker of, 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 of a blower of bubbles from the pot of idealism. There are historians who argue that World War I and World War II are the same war, that there really is a continuum between the two of them. And had the Treaty of Versailles with the League of Nations and the 14 points been passed, um, we might not have had a World War II. <coughs> The, the Treaty of Versailles that Wilson proposed was not ratified by the Congress of the United States. And so, he went on a whistle-stop program. This is him um, in Tacoma, he went to Pasco, he went everywhere the train went. Um, so he did whistle stops all along the trains. He went to the, the big stadium high school in Tacoma. He had a parade in Seattle. What is he trying to do? It's, it's midterm elections. He is wishing to um, gather the votes that would pass that treaty. The influenza epidemic, this is a very packed decade. Look at these workers from Bartels in Seattle. They're wearing surgical masks that they douse in vinegar every 15 minutes. They don't really know how to stay safe, but they're keeping that pharmacy open so people could fill their prescriptions. <coughs> the lists of the dead are in every newspaper in this state month after month. So the Great Red Scare ends the war. There's a tremendous reaction to a lot of the radical talk uh, that had become very common during the war. I'm happy to email this to anybody who wants it. The, um, this is really a vigilante organization advertising in, um, in the Times in this case, but it's all over the state, to raise money to investigate people. The Espionage Act has just been passed. There's going to be a wave of deportations, and these folks will be helping with that. So we come back to, I just don't, I can't see what's coming. We come back to the faces that mean so much, the faces that I hope you will be encouraged to learn more about, to honor, to revere their, their sacrifice, to understand what it meant, to fight for the liberty of the world, to fight for the League of Nations, to fight for a war that would make sure there were never any more wars. We know this man only as Harold. We know nothing more about him. To me, he symbolizes the need for research. History is not done with World War II, with World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars. There's a lot of work to be done. And then I just wanted to end with this. We segue into the Roaring Twenties after World War I. This is not a shock, this happens in the Korean <coughs> War, but this is cool flappers and hot jazz, short skirts and hip flasks, jalopies that you could joyride in. Um, the 1920s were a dramatically changed world in Washington. So thank you for letting me um, do an overview of some of the ideas of World War I. Thanks. <laughs> the history of World War I right in your own community and locate those memorials and tidbits of history that make our past come alive. Our final speakers today are the students, educators, and project developer for the Amazing Monuments Project. Utilizing a technology developed by Mr. <coughs> Tim Fry, who is here today, the students of Mr. Anthony Reventes' class at Lopez Island Middle School traveled here today to talk about their collaboration transatlantically with students at the American School in Paris to tell the untold stories of World War I service members from Washington State who are buried in the American Cemetery in France. And I will have them come up and introduce themselves, each of them, and speak about the project. And we'll see what we can do about this image. Oh, okay.
Thank you, Susan. Uh, my name is Tim Fry. Uh, uh, that was a great, great talk by Lorraine, and she's absolutely right that history is not done when it comes to World War I. And I guess that's probably what we're here to, to talk about. Um, we're actually, we have two uh, schools represented here today, uh, one in person from Lopez Island, and one uh, about 5,000 miles away uh, in Paris, France. And these two schools are working together on a project called the Monuments Project, which, as Susan said, is really all about telling the untold stories of 29 Washingtonians who sacrificed their lives in World War I and are buried uh, in the American Cemetery in Seren, which is right outside of Paris, and there's a picture of it. Um, so we have here in person uh, several students from Lopez Island Middle High School and their teacher, Anthony Reventi. Um, this group got, got up probably before the sun came out this morning so they could catch the first ferry off of Lopez Island uh, to join us in person. So thank you guys very much for coming down. Um, and then in a little bit, you're going to hear uh, via recorded video um, from two teachers, uh, Tom Neville and his teaching partner, uh, Claude Lord from the American School of Paris and a couple of their students. So just to set, set a little bit of context, last year uh, I joined uh, the students from Lopez Island uh, Middle School and Mr. Reventi on a very similar project that we called Project Wa, which was uncovering the untold stories of the historic places around Washington State. And uh, we collaborated to use new mobile technology um, to not only um, educate people about some of these untold stories of Washington State history, but also incentivize them uh, to go out and explore. So I'm going to ask Mr. Reventi to uh, tell you a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. So we asked ourselves a question, and uh, we took a look at, is it possible to take a technological approach to teaching history? And uh, so, can we get students to get excited about history using mobile technology? Is it possible to even build an app for the group of students? And so that's the question we started with. And how we answered that question was through Project Law. And we turned a small group of students uh, in my Washington State history class into a startup. And they became the managers of the project. And we developed uh, a mobile app called the Washington State Insider App. So what was in this app? What is this all about? So our students chose people and places they saw to be the most meaningful places in Washington State history. And then they researched those often uh, overlooked aspects of Washington State history. And uh, we populated the app with locations throughout the state, and anyone could download this app and, and visit those locations. Um, and to incentivize people to actually get out there and explore history, um, students uh, or, or anyone using the app could um, visit these locations, collect points, and then cash those points in at the Washington State History Museum for entry. Uh, so one result of this approach uh, was we engaged our students uh, not only just to learn about um, a particular aspect of history, but to create meaning behind why we would learn about it in the first place. And instead of just having a grading book, um, students created kind of a living technological document, right? That uh, they could go out and um, help preserve some of the locations that, that they discovered. And uh, that is why 
our students were awarded Washington State's Historic Preservation Officer Award uh, for 2016 last year. We're really proud of that. So uh, the response that we received was far and wide, and that kind of confirmed that we might be onto something here. And one of the people that we heard from was a teacher uh, from the American School in Paris named Thomas Neville. And I'd like to introduce him to you right now. Hello, I'm Paris, France. I first learned about Project Law um, around the same time that I was talking with Gerald Lowe, the American Battle Monuments Commission. ABMC maintained cemeteries abroad for American service members that did not make it home. And Gerald was telling me about the Surround American Cemetery, which is just down the road from the American School of Paris, where I work. And he presented to me what seemed to be a very natural scenario for a really engaging uh, project-based learning opportunity for my students, which is that this cemetery is full of individuals whose stories haven't been told. And perhaps with some committed and diligent work, um, our students could have a role in telling those stories. And he also added that that cemetery is sort of an anomaly in the sense that, unlike some other cemeteries, it's not associated with a single event or battle, um, but has people buried there who have had very different experiences during the war. So following any one direction in terms of one soldier's experience could reveal a whole lot of context that students wouldn't otherwise be exposed to and that they would be the owners of. So I knew that we needed to tell the story, that we needed to be involved in it. Uh, it was local. It was authentic, and it had a little import. And having done a lot of digital mapping and crowdsourcing stuff, I was, I was interested in exploring that avenue again. And then I saw what Anthony and Tim had done with the Lopez Island students and how excited they were um, and how powerful their reflections were from the project in that article. And I thought, about halfway through, why not? And I emailed them before even finishing the article and heard back from them. We've been meeting once a week ever since to work on the Monuments Project. And so starting this week, students from the American School of Paris in France and Lopez Island in Washington will team up to start trying to research and tell the stories of these individuals and the role that they play at this pivotal point in history and the process, developing real skills for research and teamwork and a sense of the diligence, resilience, and creativity that can be required in telling stories that are not yet told. And in the process, I think most important, <coughs> having an opportunity to develop their own perspective on the conflict and the time period and transfer that ability to new settings going forward. It was very important to us that the project would be student-driven and our role as teacher would be to facilitate their journey of discovery. For this, we are very grateful to have the support from the ABMC, local archives in France, the Washington State Office of the Secretary of State, and the Washington State Historical Society, who help us go deep in their students' research. The student will tell the story of 29 Washingtonians buried in Surrey and will document their finding on the monumentsproject.org and through the Monuments Project mobile app. And we are joined today by two students, Jesse and David, who will be giving you a preview of the Monuments Project and a glimpse at the website. This week, my classmates and I met our research partners on Lopez Island. We are organized into teams. Each team will focus on researching one service member from Washington buried in Surrey. We have a lot of resources on the Monuments Project website to help us find information about our service member. We don't yet know where this research will lead us, but we have a great starting point, thanks to the help of our research partners in the U.S. and France. As we find information from around the world, you'll be able to add locations to the Monuments Project map. Clicking on these pins will give people more information about their individual service members, where they were born, their regiment, quotes from them, and where they died in war. We have an archive where we'll upload various materials, for example, newspaper articles, draft documents, photographs, and maps. We'll be able to earn badges for different accomplishments during this project. And most importantly, we'll be able to tell the stories of individual service members. We'll do this on the website as well as in the Monuments Project app. <laughs> I'm going to do the 
clicking that that student was prompting me to do. Um, so this is just a screenshot of the website that is going to serve as home base uh, for our Lopez students and the students from the American School of Paris. Um, this is where they're going to be collaborating, um, even though they're, they're separated by 5,000 miles in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, we have the website up and running, so you can check it out at the table in the back after the ceremony. Um, and, and it was just last week that we introduced the students to each other. Um, and each school pulled together a video introducing their school to the, um, to the other students. And then we have bios, short bios of every single student. Um, we have about roughly 25 or 30 uh, on Lopez Island and as many as like 70 or 75 at the American School of Paris. And so they, they wanted to introduce um, themselves to each other. Um, they, they have what we call their briefcase, uh, where they have links to all sorts of archives, the Washington State Archives, the National Archives, all sorts of helpful information to, to help the students uh, embark on their research that they're just now starting. Um, you heard about the map. Uh, this is a pretty cool interactive map that will showcase and pinpoint all the locations around the world that are associated with these 29 Washingtonians who are buried uh, in Seren. And then you can dive in and, and uh, for instance, I think this is about uh, Homer Ward's high school down in Centralia. Um, we'll have an archive full of uh, photos and documents. Um, you know, and most importantly, um, we're going to have full pages with, with all sorts of information related to each of these uh, service members um, who are buried in Seren. Um, so that's the website. This is where the students will be collaborating. But as you know, we're also creating a mobile app that I'm going to ask the Lopez students take you through. Yeah. Um, like we did with our Washington State Insider app, we are going to create a mobile app that will reward people for visiting different locations related to these service members. So for instance, if somebody using the app goes to visit the cemetery where these soldiers are buried, they can look and see each of the gravestones of the soldiers that we researched and click on a pin that gives them more information about the soldier. When people click on each pin, they'll get more information about the fallen soldier buried there. They can also earn points for visiting, which they can later redeem for reward. We hope that the other students around the world will want to get involved in the Monuments Project so they can tell the untold stories of service members from their own communities. So our, our hope uh, is that this will provide inspiration and a model for other schools around the world um, to engage in this kind of work and to use new technology to uncover uh, those untold stories um, throughout history. Um, so we are, uh, today we're announcing the Monuments Project and we are inviting schools from around the world to, to join in. And hopefully this will become a truly global effort, not only to tell these untold stories of um, you know, people who sacrificed their lives in World War I, but I think more fundamentally uh, to set an example for how we as a human race should be joining hands and collaborating across borders today. So um, please follow our work at monumentsproject.org. Uh, we're also on Instagram, and I think we'll be posting several photos every day of, of some of these untold stories. So thank you very much for joining us and, uh, and we'll be answering questions in the back afterwards.